Hello everyone and welcome to another great panel discussion at the Buzz Expo China Summit. The topic today is how to transform a not so hot destination into an attractive one. And not only how to build a company, but how to build a destination. I am very happy to introduce you today to Gajimit Haicha. Over the last weeks we were not sure if he will be able to attend. He and his wife had corona, but thanks to God they're doing fine again. Gazi is a very interesting personality who has a lot to tell with a lot of energy. So look forward to getting all the information you need out of this panel. And with these words, I hand over to Gazi. Gazi, great to have you here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Marcus, for the uh, introduction. And I'm very pleased to be part of this very interesting um, panel on the Buzz Expo China Summit. But I'm more pleased to have some very important voices and very interesting personalities on the panel today. And I want to start with a person at the top of the screen, uh, Milos Terovich, who is an expert in the field of hospitality. And whenever I think of Milos, I think that he was born in the hospitality industry. I don't know which age he started being a GM, but always, I think it's an understatement whenever I hear him that he has been all around the world and he has been playing different functions. And today, he is the GM of the most successful hotel in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, Slovenia, Intercontinental Hotel, part of the IHG Group, and belonging to a Delta Group of Serbia, which is one of the leaders in the hospitality field in the Balkans. And on top of this, Milos is a very honorable member of the Young President Organization. And I want to welcome Milos and I want to ask him to say a few words. And thanks for coming to the panel, Milos. Thank you very much, Ghazi, for the kind introduction. And I'm pleased to be part of the Buzz Expo China Summit uh, panel. And I would like to also welcome all the listeners and all the panelists as well. Um, I'm happy to be representing the hotel industry on the panel. And like Ghazi said, I work for the large chain Intercontinental Hotels Group and located currently in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. And uh, I'm uh, very excited to discuss this uh, topic of the current trends and current uh, happenings in the health industry, in uh, travel industry and how it affects uh, how the corona and COVID-19 affects all of us. Thank you, Milos. Thank My you, pleasure. Milos. We look forward to um, having your contributions to the uh, discussion. Thank you. The second person on the panel, and I'm very honored to have, is Edin Kolarevich, who comes from Kotor, Montenegro. And Edin is a very interesting character. It's not only for the fact that he is another honorable member of the YPO Network Young President Organization, but knowing him personally and reading his CV, I don't know from where to start. So he's uh, used to be an invest uh, in investment uh, banking. Um, he is a person very active in sports. He is active um, in uh, other areas with big interest in spirit spirituality, um, in history, and very importantly, he figured out that he has a um, big desire for being an entrepreneur. And he showed that by uh, playing out, by planning out, and by building one of the best uh, boutique hotels in the Bay of Kotor called Puma Bay. So, Edwin, we are pleased to have you and to uh, have you join the panel, and I'd like you to say a few words. Very warm afternoon to all the participants of today's discussion from sunny Montenegro. Uh, thank you very much for your flattering words, Gazi. And I express my gratitude to you for inviting me to take a stance on a number of interesting topics today. I hope for the discussion to be very interesting and educating. And I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing on a number of topics. Thank you, Edin. And um, 
I go to the last panelist, and his name is Stavri Chifliku, and he comes from Albania. And Stavri is an historian and archaeologist. He is a very intrepid traveler who has been in more than 100 countries. And I think he's one of the few people in this world who has been to both Koreas, North and South as well, next to myself. So last year we were in Kyrgyzstan, where today there is a political revolution. So we have explored the world together. And apart from this, Avery has a full-time job and he is the product manager at Landry's International. Very happy to have you stop here on board and a few words from yourself as well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, when I got invited, I said um, it's a great honor to be with such panelists and uh, to have the opportunity to discuss about the future of this industry in these difficult moments, but uh, which we are all looking very hopefully and um, very uh, with a great ferocity to return back to the new normal because it won't be any more a normal as we knew it. But uh, we are all working together, and uh, I'm sure that uh, in Gazi's presentation we will get some insights about what are the keystones, what are the milestones to work together and to move to a direction which will bring this industry to a new level. So thank you very much and uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation and the discussion later on. Well, thank you, Stavri, thank you, Eddie, thank you, Milos, once again. So all the professionals in the travel industry agree that the travel shutdown has mostly devastated the emerging economies dependent on tourism and Western Balkans is among those economies. Not long ago, this part of the world was considered a bright spot in Europe's tourism growth. And the four panelists hope that this will be the future as well. With this being said, we invite you to watch a video we prepared, especially for Buzz Expo China Summit. Are you willing to travel less? I've been keeping my finger on the pulse of the travel industry over these last few months. And as a travel insider, trust me when I say that the industry is humming with discussions. And while nobody knows when exactly travel will make a full post-pandemic comeback, people are eager to resume traveling again, as for now. The complexity and vastness of the travel industry make it difficult to know exactly how and when it will happen. But this is a journey, like a personal one, which we usually start alone and through following our instincts and vocation brings us to unknown paths. We blend into nature and move forward. As nature regenerates by itself, so do societies who embrace together like in the arms of your beloved ones of your family. Travel is more than making a living. It is sharing experiences, love and affection. No one has the answers, but if we fully give ourselves to the world, like we give to our families, nature will nurture those. It's time to recover and rebuild through love. Well, thank you for, for watching this emotional video because we keep remembering only the beautiful moments that these countries went through with tourism, which we hope will come back very, very soon. And with that being said, I'd like to invite you to a small presentation, which I have prepared for uh, this summit regarding the beauty of the Balkans and why Balkans deserve to be called the gem in this European products, which we are confronting on a daily basis. So Balkans 
A tourism recovery, a perspective for, Ch for China outbound market and lessons for the other regions in the age of COVID-19. So Balkans is a small destination in a large tourism market. And whenever we speak of Balkans, we think of these 10 countries, which is in different colors in the map of Europe. You know, tourism officials and entrepreneurs from all over the Balkans are angling for a bigger slice of the lucrative Chinese tourism market. And I see that all the Balkan countries have really upped their game in trying to be very proactive in trying to invite the uh, tourism officials from China, tour operators, in order to really showcase the beautiful things that they have. So what will be the incentives for a faster recovery, which we keep asking ourselves? As some of the Balkan countries have successfully applied a visa exam policy for Chinese tourists, they have been very, very welcoming, and they have tried to do the utmost in order to welcome the Chinese tourists and be quicker than the rest of European nations in trying to welcome them open heart, with an open heart and with open arms. You see this very interesting picture, and as I say, pictures speak much louder than words, and I could not believe this picture when my team produces for the presentation today. I could not believe that we have two Chinese policemen serving together with a police force you know, from um, Serbia and Croatia. So Balkan countries like Serbia and Croatia launched joint police patrols with the Chinese police during the tourist season. And I think this speaks very, very highly of a desire to think very differently and of a different mindset that the people of the Balkans, the entrepreneurial mindset that we people of the Balkans have. We not only try to welcome our guests, but we try to outdo the welcome, the welcome rug, which we extend to our guests. And this is a case in point to be greeted and to be multiplied. And more cases like this have to be placed around and embedded in the way that we work, in the way we welcome the guests. So here we see another, um, another case where we see uh, police, uh, the address 102, and we see it's written, I mean, in, in um, you know, it's written in uh, uh, many languages. It's written in local language. It's written in Chinese as well. And this is introducing the new concept of spatial orientation for the Chinese visitors. And this has been a key factor to facilitate the FIT segment of the travelers. And with all these efforts and new ideas that the countries of the Balkans have been implementing, I, for one, have not been surprised at the big numbers and the big spike in visitors of Chinese visitors in the region in the last years. But we have to be happy of scenes like this, where we try to welcome the guests coming from the other side of the ocean, and then we don't really welcome them in the true Balkan fashion. So welcoming and keeping a positive attitude towards visitors from China and other parts of Asia, it's not only important, it is crucial. So improving the infrastructure in order to connect the regions faster and safer is a very, very big job. And I believe that the governments of the region are acting very fast to improve the infrastructure with the help of, uh, uh, you know, with the help of uh, foreign partners, of international banks, local banks, as well as the support of Chinese uh, companies as well. Because by bettering the infrastructure, not only they better the livelihoods of the people who serve, and who, who happily live in the countries, but at the same time, they create a better platform for visitors 
from China and other countries who come and they leave with big and very positive impressions. Because um, as a good friend of mine, the director of Kotri, Dr. Wolfgang is saying, it is those people who are key opinion creators, it will be these people who serve the ambassadors to bring more visitors and quality visitors to the region. So what we need to do, it's not only us to the panel, but anyone we interact with on a daily basis, we need to think and create jointly and introduce new and creative ideas that resonate to, to, to resonate the Chinese market. So I'll take a few products as an example from the countries I'm referring to. So new products, which can serve in a nice way to the um, Chinese um, visitors are, for example, in Serbia, the new Somadia Royal Wine Tours and the museums there, and then the UVAC Canyon Exploration, which have been some of the products which have been off the beaten track from the massive Chinese tourists. So the cooperation that we have had with the hotels serving there, with the tourism industry players, has been in such a way that we have really gone deep into the history, gone deep into the layers of what exactly, in that case, the country of Serbia has to offer and what could make the difference with the other countries, not only from the region, but out of the region of the Balkans. And then we can continue with the, you know, the boat in Slaviana, the medieval night boat in Slaviana, the Kovacica in uh, Naive Art Idver Farm, but even very um, interesting um, activities, which people with a very busy lifestyle cannot get in beach into. The underground Belgrade is one, or the raspberry picking, which is another one. And especially for family with kids, the raspberry picking, for example, in Serbia has proven like a very, very hot, um, a very hot trip and activity because it involves not only being in close um, contact with nature, but at the same time where the whole family co-works together and is in a, in a physical activity as well. So these are the kind of products which make the Chinese visitors think that we as a whole on this part of the border have thought very seriously about creating products which have a say, creating products which are not easily to be co copied, and creating products which means that we have really thought about the psychology of the visitors vis visiting us. So they're not just numbers, but we really treat them as very honorable personalities. And then we can go into like more uh, pure, uh, uh, Belgrade restaurant experiences, a more folk classes, dancing and learning, and then more like ethno villages and train rides, and then more Serbian pass, you know, in the in Banya region. So the products which we have created have been so numerous that we ourselves have now believed that there is so much treasury in the countries we just were covering. And then we continue to beautiful Montenegro, one of the pearls of the region. And then apart from the usual uh, activities, which Montenegro boasts quite a lot, I think we went more and, and delved deep into the Mamula Island Blue Cave trips. And then you have the Plantage Vineyard, and then more activities of the kind where in the Plantage Vineyard, the, it's not only for the wine enthusiasts, but it's even for people who want to have more knowledge about what the people of Montenegro are active, what they export, so you can have a very nice introduction to the cultures of the Montenegrins, to their long history, which they will demonstrate with the history of wine, but even to encourage a more exports of their wine. And we have cases like Bulgaria and North Macedonia, which have put themselves in the map through a lot of activities, and one of them was visits in the vineyards. And then we can continue with the Kolashin Snow Dream 
and that is to show that Montenegro is not only a summer destination, but it's an all near destination. And we have worked very, very closely with our partners to really see what is hidden there or what more we can, you know, we can offer. And then I can continue with the dormitory, Jeep Safari Tour, with the Oman Resort dining, local lunch, and prosciutto making, you know, Tara Bridge, um, you know, most. So it's a lot of activities. And we have tried to differentiate activities from one country to the other in order to shine out these activities, which really have the Montenegrin flag on top, and they are very proud of having it. And then we continue to Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we created um, very interesting tours. And one of them is the Walter Defense Sarajevo tour based on the movie. So that's a way how countries build their soft, uh, demo I mean, soft diplomacy through um, the art, through the exhibitions, and through especially interaction to the people. While they played in the movie, while they were bypassers, while they have a contribution for the movie, and so on and so on. And then we continue with the cable car of Sarajevo, with a very iconic wood carving, and then the very famous four sobe Cosmo de Safia, which is where guests uh, co cook, they co collect the products and they enjoy the lunch or the dinner over there. And then more like hikes in uh, nature and more like fruit picking. I mean, things which a lot of visitors have not had a chance in their life to do. Very importantly, they do it, but they do it not only beautifully, but we manage to have a great balance between quality and the price level. And then we go to the famous Croatia where total Games of Thrones experience has been a big, big thing. But we try to be very picky and very selective. So we try to see exactly what are the stories which vibrate in the countries in Asia, or what are the stories from, from Games of Thrones, very famous, which a Chinese mind would like to see, which might be different from a Japanese mindset. And we, being active in 12 countries in Asia, try to make sure that we play this card as well. And then we continue with the uh, island tours, and I can mention the Kornadi tour, which is not very touristic, the Marco Polo tour in Korchula, the oyster tasting Malistone, the being part of the different opera programs that they have, organizing in different castles, and so on and so forth the underwater um, activities, which is for water, um, for water specialists. And then we continue in the ethno agro park with the advent experience in Zagreb, in the city, the tangerine harvest, and you can mention many, many, many more of these. And then we continue with Slovenia, the very famous Slovenia, and then we start with the Vlad Lake. We have the steam train in Boeing Railway, and then the glacier wellness, and then you can continue with plenty of things without forgetting what you can do itself in the city of Ljubljana, where the city itself is an exhibition of what you can do in terms of arts, and even the stay at the very famous, um, very famous uh, intercontinental hotel in Ljubljana. I think it's an experience in itself, and I believe my friend Milo should agree to that. And then you have beer on tap in Maribor, a cable car in Bohin, Fonda Fish Farm. And again, we have to say that it's a very small country with a very rich menu of activities, a rich history, and even going from one border to the other, it's a few hours, which makes it very easy to go through a few countries within a few days. And then we go to Albania. Then we start with Albanian women tours, cooking holiday class in Tirana, which has become very famous, where we have the cooks, very famous cooks, who have won awards, and they do the whole experience with guests. Not only cook, but they do the shopping in the organic farms, 
they get the learnings where the where the fruits and vegetables were grown. They cook and they water down the food with the beautiful rakia for which we're very happy, we're very famous. And then we make sure that we even act responsibly after a few shots of rakia. Very enjoyable, very very enjoyable um, things we do. And then we go to um, to Bulgaria, where we have um, you know experiences how to make wines, where people you know, um, and actually in the picture you see a real um, it's not an artist, it's a real tourist dressed in a local costume and uh, trying to crush the grapes from which wine is made. And then we have um, a lot of uh, how yogurt is done. And these are a few things which we try to attract the visitors. And on top of this, we tell about the gastronomy. And very importantly, we tell about where they'll be staying. So we try to go to very selective um, places which have a history. So in all the places we go, we try to educate them about the history of the place because nothing will be more important than when that person from China goes back and is reminded of the fact that they stayed over in a place where there was a history, where they met the owner or the enthusiastic guy who opened the door for them. And for us, this is, we share experiences. So this will be the future. And this will be the future of travel, that we all will be part of it. We all will be part of this big dance, but we need to be part of this big dance in a very proud fashion, like we are. So I'd like to end with a few more slides where we can say that we need to do more than just innovating. The key word to success during these trouble times is better cooperation, which means that we cooperate on how we can add value, how we can suggest value proposition to each and each individual partner, and how we can convey that to all the partners we have, which are bringing us this very valuable tourists. So better cooperation can only be achieved through what I call over communication with both our partners and our suppliers, because we all are part of the same ecosystem. And we feel that we are partners in the same tourism game where there should be only winners. So for a better understanding, and this is why I put this, uh, this slide, so there's no shame for saying we don't understand. There's no shame. This is why the Buzz Expo Summit in a way serves in my book as a kind of encyclopedia for mindset and understanding better the Chinese mindset, but even for the Chinese listeners and Asian listeners to better understand what we guys in the Balkans will have to say and this is why I'm looking forward to your insights in the panel, which will come in a few minutes. So in order to be ready for change, we need to make sure that if we go the old ways, we're done. We are wasted. So we need to incorporate the best, which has served in the past. And we understand that the future will not be the same. So we don't prepare this kind of scenario for the future. I believe that we have lost the game even before we start. So what will be the new normal? I believe we can have hypotheses, which is a great thing, but still it's a lot of question mark because even by its very definition, the future has not arrived yet. But even the new future with all these question marks, but sitting and doing nothing is a recipe for disaster. So not, neither of the four panelists we are here, which I know personally, are not the kind of people who sit and wait for the future to knock on them. They are people, individuals, very entrepreneurial, who co-create the future. And that's what I believe will be the new normal. So with that being said, I want to thank you for, I want to thank you for the, um, 
for following this um, presentation ahead. And uh, I'd like to say now, I want, I want to go back to the panel and uh, I want to say that in this panel, we'll be posing a few questions to my closest partners, who are at the same time among the major stakeholders of the industry from the region. So the question will be how they're coping with the new realities and challenges today. What are they planning for the months to come? And how do they envision their own eyes rebuilding, the rebuilding of this devastated sector? So the first question is, and I'll st I want to start with you, Milos, is um, before the pandemic, the Balkans, also known as the New Europe, was considered the driving force in the growth of European inbound tourism, with Montenegro and Turkey reported double-digit growth so far this year, with 50% and 12% respectively, with Slovenia and Greece falling with 8% each, and Serbia at 4%. The growth of China as a forced market to some of these markets was described as staggering. Montenegro saw a 150% percent growth, Serbia at 55 and Croatia 44. Now, do you believe that through a strong commitment from the governments and the major stakeholders like yourself in this industry, is it possible to return back to the normal by mid-2021? Well, Gazi, first off, I want to thank you for the thorough introduction to, for our region to all Chinese travelers. I believe that you only uh, hit the tip of the iceberg and there's so much more to be seen and to to learn about our region, beautiful region. And uh, I can agree with the stats um, that are showing the growth uh, for the last uh, few years. I know that Slovenia, in fact, was uh, uh, recording a double-digit growth for of the Chinese tourists and the tourists in general for the last seven years, which is a humongous growth. Um, to the point where uh, we decided to even hire a Chinese receptionist and in the restaurant during our breakfast we were having and preparing the Chinese food corner. That's how important Chinese travelers were uh, for our market. Um, in terms of the unknown, yeah, that's in terms of the 2021, it's a big unknown. Uh, it all depends on the um, resolving the health issues if we can get to the point where we um, open the borders and reboot the air traffic, then I'm pretty certain that Chinese travelers would uh, love to come back, love to visit, and uh, especially explore the hidden gems of Europe and the rest of the world. And the Balkans, and especially Western Balkans, are uh, definitely a hidden gem of Europe. So uh, I wouldn't be as... Uh, positive as some of the people may think. So 2021 may not be as realistic, but definitely 2022, I have high hopes that Chinese traveling travelers will come back to the Western Balkans. Um, well, thank you, Milos, for your insights. And I really value them because uh, I really find your thoughts I mean, on the positive side, but very realistic. And I'd really love to hear what our friend Edin has to add to this question. Um, I personally believe that strong commitment from the governments, Ghazi, needs to be demonstrated on a number of levels. First, we ought to face the reality of situation. I'll just give you some figures that you can uh, later on elaborate but official ones say that compared to 2019 the decline in number of visitors sits at 78 percent while the respective decline in total generated income is close to 83 percent now given that tourism accounts for 30 plus percent of country, country's gdp it is fair to say that the economy has taken the hardest hit in the last 25 years we are basically dependent on tourism, much more than most of the European countries. And that alone is a strong determining point for us. This circumstance cannot change overnight. 
our other natural resources are scarce. We do not have fossil fuels and agriculture is still very underdeveloped. Therefore, tourism, which has seen a remarkable growth in the last 15 years, is our best and only chance of surviving. However, just like you said, no work gets done without action. My firm belief is that our government needs to create a reasonable and well-structured recovery plan, which will envisage a closer bonding and partnering with source markets that have already showed signs of economic revival and, to an extent, normalized air travel. China is undoubtedly one of them. Yet, Chinese tourists, like any of the world travelers, will need to feel safe in order to choose Montenegro over other destinations. This calls for another action. We must anticipate and deal with all the challenges of making Montenegro as COVID-free as possible. Health regulations need to be upheld responsibly. Borders and customs controls ought to be punctual and effective. And probably most importantly, PCR and similar tests should be collected and submitted by travel agents beforehand so that entry to the country can be granted for all the travelers simultaneously, rather than each one individually. These measures, I'm sure, would certainly ease up the drill to the benefit of both sides and even pave the way for application of similar procedures in post-COVID era. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adin, for, um, for the very uh, wise comments you made. And I believe that your platform can serve as a background for many governments of the region in order to come up with an action plan. Because as you cleverly said, this, actional, this actionable plan needs to be reasonable as well. So I cannot agree more to the fact that for all the countries um, of the region, industry of tourism is the key player and governments need to be more proactive and not only proactive, but they need to really show to help in any way possible, not only in terms of, um, you know, policies to be done, but financially support wise, even to understand that the real pain is all the guys in this industry who are playing the game. And I'd like to hear Scabri as well to say a few comments on that as well. Okay, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you, Gazi, for your thorough presentation. And uh, I would like to start from where Edin uh, actually stopped, and I would like to bring it to another level, uh, which is the local cooperation. Uh, as we know, the Balkans is a very specific area, which is divided in between the European Union and non-European Union. So the effect over the border crossings, it's more tangible compared to a lot of other regions, which might be Central Europe or Western Europe, where the border procedures are more flexible. So in this case, us as stakeholders in this industry should work closely together in between us and of course serve as a pressure group to our government to make it come closer together and create one of those bubbles of those travel bubbles which will enable people which of course need to be safe but need also to travel to feel welcome to our region and not to be stopped or felt unwelcome to certain regions so luckily um, during this period the six countries of the Western Balkans, as they are known, have been cooperating quite closely together. And uh, this bulb has served to a certain extent, but I believe that we should bring this to another level. And this comes only through cooperation, close cooperation in the industry. of. Well, thank you for your input, Starry. And I'd like to start um, with Milos again, because very interestingly, they were they, they have been very innovative in having a uh, at the reception a Chinese speaker, a Chinese national, and even cooking Chinese um, uh, food for breakfast. And I think this is quite an achievement, uh, um, Milos. 
And I believe that this kind of news needs to be shared widely with all the stakeholders so that we can, on our side, promote them in a much bigger way. And I have a question for you. How is the sector of hospitality accommodation in that fact, I mean, that particular case in the Balkans adapted to the new challenges and innovation tools used as elsewhere around the globe, like the shift to touchless travel in hotel check-in? Has automation in the Balkans become the new norm? Have you thought about it? How is it being per perceived by by customers? Guys, I'm sorry to interrupt. I lost you for a second. Do you mind just repeating okay. the question? So how has the sector of hospitality accommodation in the Balkans adapted to the new challenges and innovation tools used elsewhere around the globe, like the shift to touchless travel in hotel check-ins? Has automation in the Balkans become the new norm? What is the feel? How is this being perceived by the end users? And what benefit does it bring in return? Well, I think uh, we're still adapting to the new normal and to the new norms of travel industry. I believe that uh, travelers are still don't have that confidence in traveling. So they're waiting to see what's going to happen and whether there will be a vaccine, what kind of restrictions will be lifted from the uh, airlines, hotels and so on. The focus is primarily on health and safety. We gave it a lot of thoughts in the last six to eight months on health and safety of our guests and employees and all the stakeholders. So we invested quite a lot in the touchless points throughout the hotel, whether it comes to the check-in or a cleaning of the rooms or a breakfast that is maybe delivered uh, through room service only if uh, the travelers are a little bit more concerned about uh, safety or if there is um, service being done in the restaurant, of course, all the hygienic and safety precautions and measures were taken up front. We have done a lot of uh, uh, research in terms of the mice business because we feel that mice business will suffer the most because from the hotel standpoint and from the airlines, because now the clients are getting used to the uh, technical advancement and meetings through the Zoom, through Teams, through Skype, and it's going to be very hard to envision that somebody makes that first move and say, okay, let's now go, go back to the old ways of traveling where we, where we bring the whole company, 300, 400, 500 of us, and we all go somewhere central, like in Paris, and then spend... Uh... Milos? I think we lost Milos. I think we lost Milos, yes. Yeah. Um, uh... Let's see when um, <clears throat> well, Milo joins. Um, so um, I think I can uh, do the question with Milos. But meanwhile, let's use the time. And uh, I have a question for Edin. And the question is, um, Edin, that this crisis has proved to have had major repercussions in a larger part of the industry, but to devastating figures in the tourism sector. The abrupt closure of borders has proven lethal to several areas of the sector. Do you believe that by diversifying tourism to avoiding dependence on one single activity or market, such crisis can be overcome more smoothly? Foreign visitors are high value exports and must be considered as part of national export promotion programs. But at the same time, domestic markets are often the backbone of the sector. Do you agree on this? Matter of fact, I couldn't agree more, Ghazi. When I went, want to make a joke uh, about my friends who are big in trade and supermarket business, I tell them, hey, guys, you buy the German salami and sell it to the local consumers, uh, whereas I buy the local prosciutto and sell it and serve it to the German guests. <laughs> Who's the bigger patriot? Um, I believe tourism ought to be heavily supported by national ex export promotion programs. And now that it is in danger, even more so. Montenegro's hotels have caught up with uh, very high standards lately. Top-notch brands are in the market already. Hilton, Regent, Amman Resorts, one and only, Chetty, Sheraton, Ritz-Carlton. The national strategy set a decade ago proposed a very simple goal. 
develop Montenegro as a high-end exclusive destination with an ADR as close to that of more developed countries like Italy and Spain. We, ha we have succeeded for the most part. Porto Montenegro is the most sought after European marina for mega yachts. Porto Novi with the newly opened one and only hotel is among the biggest and most remarkable greenfield projects in Europe. And Bigova Bay financed by the Royal family of Abu Dhabi, although at the very commencement, is supposed to outshine the previous two once fully developed. All stated above has pretty much set the tone of exclusivity when Montenegro is mentioned. I strongly believe we ought to continue in this direction while uh, with pending and future projects. Such projects mostly attract foreign tourists with higher consumption power. To attract them further, I think that the government and its incentives must come through creating a more solid travel infrastructure as well as a liberal visa regime namely for the tourists from the Far East. And that, of course, includes our Chinese friends. Of course, we must never underestimate the importance of the domestic and regional markets. Lower rated hotels and private accommodation amount for over 70% of the market and thus play a significant role in the yearly gross output. Therefore, we need to preserve the balance between the two niches by heavily promoting the attractiveness of Montenegro as a high-end destination, while keeping those with shallower pockets happy with their choice as well. Take Las Vegas, for example. It always amazes me that there is fun and glamour for everyone. Those who can afford a boxing spectacle at MGM or a Celine Dion concert will stay at Twin or Bellagio, but later at night will mix with an elderly couple at a bar or by a slot machine without either side feeling inadequate about the presence of the other. This comparison, of course, might be a little far-fetched, but I'm sure you're getting an idea of how important for Montenegro it is to transpire as inclusive rather than exclusive destination in the future. Well, thank you, Edin, for the elaborate um, you know, discussion. And again, there is nothing wrong with the creating inspiring benchmarks. So we're there and um, with this, I believe that I cannot agree more that we need to diversify the range of activities to add countries to the, um, to the mix of the products we create so that we really, really have a deeper product mix to offer to our clients who love this region. Now I have a question for Starry, and that is, we have seen, you know, we have seen a lot of um, uh, very overcrowded cities, and some of us try to avoid them. And we said that one of the beauty, beautiful things that COVID pandemic brought was that we could have these cities to ourselves. So until before the pandemic started, we had experienced a steady growth of mass tourism to the point that some cities including some of the Balkans, like Dubrovnik, where we were at the brink of collapse, and could not cope anymore with the growing numbers each year. Do you believe that after the pandemic and the return to the normal life, sustainability must no longer be a niche part of tourism, but must be the new norm for every part of our sector? Mm, luckily, I am uh, coming always after Edin, and uh, I would like to start from where Edin has stopped. So I would like to emphasize the inclusivity rather the exclusivity of the destination, no matter of sustainable or mass tourism. We need to find that thin balance. It's a very thin balance in between both sectors. Uh, when we complain, uh, we complain for a reason or local communities complain for a reason. Uh, we saw at your presentation uh, those people by the wall, standing by the wall with tourists go back home. And uh, those have been some scenes in uh, huge tourist uh, hotspots like Barcelona, like in Venice, like in Dubrovnik. But the same people who were uh, writing graffitis on the wall now are crying because of the lack of tourists. Because 
a whole sector and a whole economy depends on those tourists. Uh, on the other hand, we don't have to overdue. So I fully believe that uh, this has been a catharsis, a reflective moment for societies as a whole, but for the travel industry specifically to sit, reflect, and try to find that very thin layer, very that very thin line of balancing. And uh, here uh, at Landways, we also have been taking time to think about how we should develop and uh, as was seen in uh, your presentation, some of the products are exactly combining the cityscapes with the rural landscapes into this new sustainable, but not only sustainable, but also inclusive rather than exclusive, as uh, Edin said. So I believe that uh, the future is not anymore in niches and uh, in diversifying, but diversifying into bringing it together under the same roof. Well, thank you, Shavri. And uh, I want to ask Milos on the question um, of the challenges and innovation tools, which you so nicely, Milos, uh, referred to. Now, I have a tough question for you, um, because I believe there is no modesty about reality. And how have you played this balance uh, between being an entrepreneurial individual like you are and playing the game, or like balancing the game with representing a chain like Intercontinental? And which has been, let's say, your entrepreneurial support, or which has been company-wide rules? And the second question is, again, this is not a forum where we advertise what we do, but I wonder whether you are the only hotel in, in that part of the world doing this kind of thing, so whether you are one of the leaders. Well, I think, guys, you're spot on when you say um, we got to be and thinking like entrepreneurs these days. And that's exactly what IG did. Um, we understand that some of our owners uh, are experiencing difficult times and we try to put ourselves in their shoes. And Edin is one of the owners and he knows exactly what it means when the occupancies are in the mid 20s or uh, mid 30s and uh, uh, bank payments are uh, due to come in and you have to repay the loans of the, on the assets. So we actually put our owners uh, hats on and uh, start thinking like, what would we do? Do we really need to stick to our brand standards all the way or should we flex them? Should we maybe uh, put the grace period on some of the uh, more expensive and less uh, influential brand standards and stick to the core values and assist the uh, the owners with uh, and by coping coping through these difficult times. So, for example, instead of running four restaurants, we are actually running only two of them. We decreased uh, the number of employees, made our operation more efficient, and ensured that there are no uh, spendings that is unnecessary. We continue promoting our hotel. We continue. Uh, market our destination, but we do that through a much wiser way. We use our digital platforms. We no longer uh, look for uh, uh, market marketing agencies in the markets which cannot travel, so where there is no outbound traveling for the moment. And we try to be more engaging through our uh, social media platforms. So yes, uh, we cannot be thinking these days like old school uh, big chain companies who are arrogant and uh, not uh, looking at what our owners are doing. We have to uh, cope with them and we have to basically support them through these difficult times. Oh, well, thank you, Milos. And it looks like a very interesting uh, go-to playbook for the uh, accommodation yeah. industry. Um, and you mentioned Edin, and I want to ask a very brief question with a very brief answer for Edin. And then with so many things under your belt, 
Uh, you've been an investment banker, investment analyst with an international bank, an investor, a free spirit, different business interests. Do you regret being an entrepreneur in the accommodate in the hospitality industry, especially in those circumstances? Well, Ghazi, that's a very tough question, and I have to be uh, at my uh, most honest to, to reply the right way. I'll tell you that since I've been in hospitality and hotel industry, it's probably been the most enjoyable uh, era of my life. It's the cycle that I adore and cherish the most. And uh, when I speak from my emotions, of course, I will tell you that I'm more than happy to be in the industry and uh, I look see myself in the future uh, remaining where I am leading this hotel and hopefully developing future projects in the, in the industry as well. However, just to give you an, an anti-remark, uh, as, a, as a young entrepreneur, I of course uh, would prefer more if I were if the, uh, the businesses which, uh, at this point are not struggling as much. Uh, have not been uh, taking the most severe hits uh, by the COVID situation. And of course, for me, in that regard, uh, it's a big lesson. And uh, in the future, of course, I will try to uh, diversify my attention first. And of course, uh, take certain initiatives in the direction of establishing businesses which are hospitality and hotel unrelated so that hopefully when a similar situation in the future occurs uh, i know for a fact that uh, i'm not the one who is just like milos mentioned in the team digits uh milos not not the 20s and 30s this year it's been close to 15 percent of last year's revenue and if someone announced that in uh, february or march this year only seven or eight months ago uh, we would have all replied that they were joking and uh, that there is nothing looming that would, uh, you know, write down a horrific scenario. But now that we are at this point, I do believe that uh, uh, the hotel and uh, hospitality industry will bounce back. And of course, we will be there ready to uh, wait for that moment to occur. But again, I think that the biggest lesson is to diversify, try to keep eggs in different baskets in the future. Well, thank you, Edwin, for the um, very, um, let's say, positive outlook you have. And you validate our views. And you make me and uh, Milos and Starry feel that we're not stupid being in that industry. So you validate our views. And I'm very happy to hear from you as well. Um, one thing which I was afraid of, because we're coming to the close of the session, we have five more minutes. I knew that with you guys, it would be such interesting talks, and then we can continue for more and more hours. One thing I'd like in particular is that I know that with the three of you, we share the same values about the industry, about our families, about life in general, and I really enjoy your personal narratives. And this really makes it very interesting what we're discussing. Well, I have one last question, and I'll ask you to be very uh, precise, and that is the importance of investing in the human capital and talent development in the crisis. Our partnerships with travel and tourism industry leaders, universities, educational uh, centers over there, digital players, tourism associations to advance new skills for the future of work, to meet the skills needed by the sector, or do we need to reinvent ourselves, or is it both? Milos. Well, I don't want to sound contradicting because I just mentioned a few minutes ago that we decreased the number of employees from X amount to Y amount during the crisis because our occupancies and the business levels could not support the full manning. So uh, from that standpoint, this crisis is not helping our, us in terms of development of our people. But yes, uh, even before the crisis, as I mentioned, we invested a lot in uh, developing our young talent to 
uh, be able to um, relate to their foreign travelers, especially Chinese travelers. We do a lot of trainings. We do a lot of cross-exposure. We are fortunate enough to have over 200 intercontinentals alone. I'm not talking now on a larger scale with IAG portfolio, but I'm talking only intercontinental as a brand. We have 200 hotels worldwide whereby we send our talented team members to get exposure in one of the hotels across the uh, regions. And that way they learn different cultures. They get the valuable experience, which then they bring back uh, to our hotel and they're they're easily relating to our guests from wherever they might be coming. So yeah, there are a lot of trainings. We're partnering with Cornell. We're partnering with Harvard Business School. We're partnering with different um, um, hotel schools from all over the world. And uh, in this way, we're trying to not only build our uh, talent pipeline, but also to uh, infect some of the youngsters with this hotel business and teach them and uh, show them the passion that we all have for this industry and for our business. Well, thank you, Milos. And that's a corporate view as well, because as a corporate company, I think it's perhaps a different approach. And uh, Adin, what's your view for a boutique a company, for a boutique hotel? What's your view? Tell you what, Gazi, when you were making an introduction about me, you mentioned spirituality. So yeah. the answer to this question will be somewhat different. Uh, I think that the importance of investing in human capital has always been enormous. In talent development, just as well. Where we have failed lately is perhaps the human development and its more subtle sides like empathy and solidarity. We must break clues from recurring pattern of showing gratitude only when we are brought down to our knees or showing care for others when it's already too late. I would like to see a more grateful human and less solitary, more appreciative of, to the Mother Earth and the Creator and less shaped by obstinance, arrogance and force. Spirituality needs to awaken in each of us no virtue is lasting unless it is deeply embedded in our soul. We need to do good deeds in order to expect the alike for ourselves. Only a talent and capital wrapped in these traits will bring a cherished and sustainable future to all humankind, in business and beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've been very powerful um, towards the end, but I believe uh, that my job here is as well to create the bridge to what the business products would be. So for all of us on this side, we really need, we need to, to take your comments and try to translate them, how we can be more closer to the earth so that we can really create some beautiful product to serve ourselves and serves our countries and serves our pockets as well. And of course, the people which we need to train and keep them and give them jobs but not only, but jobs with meaning. Um, um, I think we're almost over, but before I thank you, I'd like to ask the three panelists with one sentence, one saying they have, um, last saying before we say thank you. So um, I'd like to start with you, Adrian. One last statement or sentence before you leave this session. I want to thank you, Ghazi, for uh, making it possible for us to participate today. It's been a great ride. And I'll try to sum it up by uh, highlighting what Savi said earlier on. And that is, let's try to get together. Let's try to work together. Let's make this beautiful region very accessible by all the world travelers and especially by our Chinese friends. Thank you very much. Beautiful, Adin. Thank you. Milos. Oh, Keep dear. believing. This is a beautiful industry and a resilient industry, and it will come back. It has shown many times in the past that, it's, that it will rebound. So I'm a big believer that the crisis is uh, close to an end, and we are going to get to enjoy uh, traveling once again very, very soon. Thank you, Milos. Stavri? Um, 
thank you very much for giving the opportunity about this panel. And uh, I would like to state basically the same thing that, first of all, uh, the industry has just slowed down. Of course, it has affected many lives, but uh, it's coming back. It's coming back very soon because we here, we have friends, family, we have colleagues who are all very eager to restart, to restart traveling, to restart their normal activities. So uh, the industry will come back, will come back, I believe, even stronger than when it stopped. But of course, it needs time. And uh, we are very anxious because this is what fear brings, anxiety. And uh, we are very anxious, but uh, we should work closely, as Edin said, as Miller said, closely together and uh, be ready for when it starts. Well, um, Milos, Edin and Starry, I love this beautiful vibe of ending the session where we all are, uh, we are full of energy, very positive energy because it's a synergy now between ourselves. It's not only because we believe in the beauty of the industry that the times should be better, but even as humans, we think that there is always better things to come for us. And for me, this has been a journey, this one hour, not only in the travel industry, but it's in our human stories, in our personal narratives. It has been a journey in spirituality, in future hope, in mindsets of individuals. And this journey would not have been this beautiful without being enabled by three individuals who are not only experts, by, but also were great friends and supporters in all things we do, because we agree to do them, because we want to push the industry further with our help. And we know that are, we are one part of this whole chain. And if one part breaks, I think nothing works. So thank you so much, Milos, for your insights. Thank you, Edin, for your comments and your contribution. And thank you, Stavri, not only for your thoughts and your contribution, but being concrete and for the time you took today in the morning in Europe in order to give more from yourself and educate us more about what this beautiful region of the Balkans can give. Thank you once again, and I will talk to you soon, and I'll see you in future um, panels together. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much, Gazi. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.